Hey guys, and welcome back to a new episode of Philips Android News, this time for April 2024. This is the format where I go over all the important changes that affect us Android developers from the past month. So in this episode, I go over all the changes from March 2024 that you need to know about so you don't need to research all that on your own, since it's already hard enough to stay up to date as an Android developer. And I can already say there are so many cool changes from the past month, so let's not wait any longer. Let's start small, and that is a new API we can now use in of Android, which is called the Fused Orientation Provider API. So maybe you already know the Fused Location Client, which is pretty much just a class that makes location access easier on Android. And we now have a similar API just for orientation. So for example, if you're building an app that uses a map, it's pretty useful to know the orientation of the user so they know which direction they are facing to. Or if you're building maybe a Compass app, then obviously you will also need the orientation of the user. And with the Fused Orientation Provider API, we now have a consistent API that can be used across devices. So that is a pretty cool part since you can just implement this logic once and then reuse for multiple device types. So you might have a mobile app and a Wear OS app, so a smartwatch app in the end, and you can just reuse the same logic for both these device types. Next up, Android Studio Iguana is now stable. So we have a new Android Studio version we can work with and I'll go through the changes now. On the one hand, we have some improvements regarding Crashlytics, so Google's crash logging library. I sadly can't show you a demo here because I don't have any project where I would be allowed to show you a demo. But in the end, what you're now able to do is when a user experiences a crash on your app, and that crash gets locked to Crashlytics, then on the one hand, you can inspect that directly in Android Studio, which is not new in Iguana. But now you can just click on the line that crashed, and Android Studio will directly point you to the line in your code. So we now have an even better integration with Crashlytics inside of Android Studio, so that makes it easier to spot the, the actual cause of the crash, or at least the actual line where the crash happened. That is one change regarding Crashlytics. The other change is that you now have a better separation between crashes. So if our code crashes at a single line, then it doesn't mean that the root cause of that crash must be the same. And in the past, it was a little bit difficult to inspect different types of crashes that occurred on the same line of code because Crashlytics just summarized these together. But now there is a better separation so you can really inspect different crashes that happen on the same line which might have a different root cause in the app. That's it regarding Crashlytics. And next up, we have some cool changes regarding the Compose Preview. So let's hop inside of Android Studio and check that out. I've opened a little social network app I've previously built where I show the profile screen preview here in the normal Jetpack Compose preview on the one hand for a local user and for a remote user, which we can follow and unfollow. And what we now have with Android Studio Iguana is a so-called UI check mode. So that's pretty much just a tool that will run over your Compose preview on different configurations, so different screen sizes, different font scaling, and then give you hints on what could be unwanted behavior. So if we go on a single preview and we go to this little toolbar, you can see some new uh, icons will appear here. And this one is this UI check mode that is new. If we click that, Android Studio will run this and we actually get some warnings, some issues that happen in our UI layout, depending on which uh, configuration that device is running on. You can see, we can now see the preview on various different devices. And for example, it highlights, hey, um, we actually have a duplicate speakable text present. It will also highlight the corresponding affected UI element. So there's a delete button here. In this case, it says, hey, um, this button has a content description that is used multiple times on the screen. So that people who might use a screen reader who could read that button kind of would not be able to distinguish between this delete button for this post and the delete button for the post below. So if they are blind, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference which post to delete. And these kinds of issues are now highlighted with this UI check mode, which you can just run very easily as you just saw. What highlights insufficient text color contrast ratio? If we click that, then you can see that hints to the little initials button of our, not button, but initials text of our profile picture, where it says, okay, there actually needs to be more contrast in order to be considered good UX. Well, this is just implemented as on the designs. So all these warnings are not necessarily meant to tell you that you have to work on this in order to have some kind of good app, but rather as little hints you should take a look at and then decide for your own and for the use case of your app if it makes sense to work on these issues. So I think that's a pretty cool change. Then we have another change regarding the Compose Preview, which is called progressive rendering. And that'll especially be cool for everyone among you who is using a little bit of a weaker machine, since this progressive rendering now allows us to scroll faster through our Compose layouts or Compose Previews. And we can see this if we switch to a list here. So we would actually need to scroll through our layout. If we then scroll fast, um, 
We're actually not going to see that here for some reason. Ah, because the check mode is probably still visible. Let's switch to list and then scroll. Yes, you can see there is a little bit of a blur, which is called progressive rendering. So if you have, let's say, 20 different preview composables in a single preview window, and you want to scroll from the very first one to the very last one, then you obviously don't need to see all those ones in between which you're scrolling through. And now this progressive rendering will just allow your machine to not need to render everything of every single preview you are scrolling through until you stop eventually at one of them. So just a little performance boost in the end. All right, that's it for the changes regarding the Compose preview. The next change of Android Studio Iguana is that we now have a baseline profile wizard. I like that a lot. And if we go to our root module, root package, new module, then we can actually see this, that we now have a baseline profile generator. A baseline profile is in the end nothing else than a list of specific classes and functions that should be pre-compiled for common, common things users would like to do in your app. So a typical use case for that is just the startup of your app, which just relies on a specific set of classes, specific set of functions in your code. And with a baseline profile, we can just say, hey, that's actually a, a, a pretty critical journey in our app. So these resources needed for that startup time can be pre-compiled and preloaded so startup is overall faster. But we can create such profiles not only for startup, but also for other critical user journeys where the user is actually doing something, maybe scrolling through a long list at the first screen or so, and that way boost our app's performance. That was always possible, but it was always a little bit of a pain to work with these baseline profiles. And now we have a wizard for that, where we can just create that much easier. All right, great. Next change is we have two new emulators. If we go to our device manager and we create a new device, then we now have the Pixel 8 Pro and Pixel 8 devices we can create as emulators. That is especially cool because on these devices, there is now the built-in AI from Google called Gemini. Gemini Pro, actually, or Gemini um, Nano. So if you're building functionality that relies on this new Gemini AI, at least on the um, built-in on-device AI that is integrated on these Pixel 8 devices, then you can now test that without having an actual Pixel 8 device. And last but not least, at least for Android Studio Iguana, that I consider worth to be talked about is that from now on, version catalogs will be the default. So if you now create a new project inside of Android Studio Iguana, you will now see in your Gradle folder this libs versions file, which will introduce all your apps dependencies inside of a version catalog. I already have a video about version catalogs. So if you're unsure about what that really is and why we should stick to that rather than to normal dependency management, then feel free to look that up on my channel. That is now the default, which I think is really cool. All right, let's leave Android Studio Iguana and jump to the next change that happened in March. And that is that we now have the second developer preview of Android 15. So the developer preview is pretty much just a version of the next Android version, which is only meant for us developers to play around with to try out to see what new features will come in future so we can already prepare adjusting our apps to these new features. And in the previous Android News episode, I already went over the new features of the first developer preview. Now we have the second one with more features being teasered. And the first one is that we have a little new UI for satellite communication. So Google puts more focus on getting internet via satellites. And they pretty much just showcase a little bit of a new UI, some new UI elements that show you that you're currently connected to a satellite. Then there are some cool changes regarding NFC. So for those of you who don't know, NFC is pretty much the communication technologies that your phones, for example, use when you pay with them. You take the phone, tap it on the card reader, and you pay by doing so. so it's comparable to Bluetooth, but on a short distance. And for two devices to communicate with each other via NFC, they need to authenticate. But this authentication is now doable before doing the actual tap, so the actual data transfer. That means you can pre-authenticate in order to make the actual tap faster. So if you already know in your app that the user is going to tap the card reader in a moment, you can already authenticate, so the actual tapping will be faster. Another cool change of Android 15, which I really like, is that our apps can now detect if they are being screen recorded. So you can imagine this to be a similar functionality as Snapchat has when it detects that you screenshotted a snap. And our apps can now detect the same just with screen recordings. So this might, for example, be very helpful for banking apps where you need to enter some kind of pin. And you want to make sure that the user entering this pin is not actually screen recorded at the same time. So on the one hand, not accidentally, but on the other hand, not via some kind of malware or so. Another cool API that we get with Android 15 is the so-called application start info API, which lets you know whether the app was started from a cold 
warm or hot state. So a cold start would be starting the app completely from scratch if it was either completely closed before or never even opened. A warm start would mean that all the activities of your app are destroyed, but there are still some resources of it in memory. For example, if you have a foreground service running, but you closed the actual app, the actual screens, then the foreground service will continue running. And if you then open the app, it's called a warm start, since there are already some resources of the app loaded in memory. And a hot start, on the other hand, would be if you just minimize the app and then open it again from the recently used apps tab. So the Android operating system just needs to bring back the recently used screen back to the uh, visible area of your phone. And now this new API just allows you to detect from which state your app was launched. And this could make it helpful for you to actually decide what to do. Maybe you want to initiate a sync every time the user really code boots the app, but you don't want to initiate that sync when the user just minimizes and reopens the app. But now this new API allows you to check for exactly that, so you don't need to always initiate that sync when the app comes back to the foreground in on resume or so. And last but not least, what I found cool, which is not affecting us developers too much, but more the users of Android 15, that there is a new smart way to regulate loudness of our apps. So you may know this, maybe you're hearing a song which has a specific uh, level of loudness and then you switch to a different app where you also hear some uh, sounds and these are suddenly super loud or super quiet because the audio was not recorded with a, a microphone with a very high sensitivity or so. And, and these kinds of inconsistencies will now be regulated from Android itself um, so it will just try to make all the sounds have a similar level of loudness, no matter how they were recorded. All right, that's it for the developer preview number two. Let's get to the next change, which I'm also really excited about since it affects Compose Multiplatform. There's a new version available for Compose Multiplatform, which is 1.6.0, and that brings a few amazing changes. On the one hand, we now have a common resource API for Compose Multiplatform. So if you are building a Kotlin multiplatform project with shared UI by using Compose Multiplatform, there is now a built-in solution to share resources. So to share drawables, to share strings and localize them, to maybe share colors for different configurations, and that works very similarly to the already showcased Moco library that I have a video here on my channel by generating type safe accessors for these resources that we actually add to our product. So we can then just have these um, type safe accessors and access our resources on every individual platform. Then we now have a common API for UI testing. So if you're now building a Compose multi-platform app, you have an API to actually UI test your screens, which is pretty cool since there's a big advantage of having a shared UI that you just need one test to cover the, the UI for multiple platforms. Then there are some improvements to the iOS accessibility so that screen readers on the iOS side can now also access the content resources, for example, from UI components on the Compose side. So if you set something to a content description on Compose, then a screen reader on an iOS device could also read that out loud. Then we also have changes regarding the Compose preview for Compose multi-platform apps, which wasn't yet available. So you wouldn't be able to preview the shared Compose code in a Kotlin multi-platform project. And that now works, but sadly for now only on JetBrains IDE fleet. So the way I understood it is that this does not yet work in Android Studio. And I don't know if fleet may be improved by now, but the last time I tried it a few months ago, it was it was okay, but not too good. It was at least in no way on a level of Android Studio. And the last change that affects Compose multi-platform is that dialogues and pop-ups are now real dialogues and pop-ups since they can exceed the bounds of their parent composable. So obviously, if you open a dialog, then that need to span the whole size of our screen, potentially with a transparent overlay and the dialog itself. And previously, that was only possible if the parent composable from which the dialog is launched was also spanning the whole screen size. And now such dropdowns, dialogues, pop-ups can exceed the bounds of the composable they are launched from. So even if you just have a tiny box in which you launch a dialog, the dialog will span the whole screen size. All right, those were all the changes that I considered worth to be talked about. Which one do you actually like the most from these? Let us know that down below. And other than that, I'll see you back in the next video and especially next month for the next episode of Philips Android News. Thanks so much for watching. Have an amazing rest of your week. See you back in the next one. Bye-bye.